Well, today's seminar is called Global Britain and India, a new special relationship. And we will the seminar has some very eminent speakers, and will be all of whom will be exploring the possibilities of Britain outside outside Europe, new trade deals, the rise of India as a as a major economic power. Uh, these things are all going to be discussed, and uh, in particular, the emphasis will be on Britain's. Uh, relationship, future relationship with one of the senior Commonwealth countries, namely India, who has a, an expanding economy and Britain outside Europe is looking, as everybody knows, for future trade deals. And so uh, that is, that's the whole theme of this particular seminar, is to explore the various possibilities. And uh, hopefully we will get some interesting conclusions. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, this is a very critical time for Britain. It has obviously a relationship with India which stretches back almost the 17th century, but Britain is going to find itself having to negotiate a whole series of free trade treaties and probably considering new strategic alliances, specifically with countries in the Asia-Pacific region. And India is going to be a very prominent target. Uh, I mean, the seminar is a fantastic opportunity to talk about, you know, UK-India bilateral relations. I'm specifically going to be talking about defense and security relations. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's been a long-standing relationship between India and the UK, and even in defense and security. But there have been some you know, misperceptions and missteps, and things have slowed down a little bit in recent times. But the foundations are pretty strong, and there are, you know, long-standing agreements, initiatives, engagements that have continued and are continuing to, you know, emerge over time. So it's just a matter of time. Is this a matter of, uh, you know, implementing certain things that are already, you know, on paper, and a matter of actually addressing some misperceptions and, you know, taking things forward from there? I think what I'd like to do is interrogate what is so special about the uk India relationship, because while there's a lot of potential, what we see in reality is a lot of problems. So what I'd like to do is discuss some of the dissonance that we're seeing at the moment between, on the one hand, this trade rhetoric that says, you know, whether it's Theresa May or Liam Fox, it's really important for us to have a relationship with India vis-a-vis -vis what they're actually doing when it comes to visa allocations, the visa process, and some of the anti-terrorism legislation that we're seeing being used at the moment to deport highly skilled migrants. So my argument is that actually unless you're able to bridge these different narratives and find a way forward that talks about what's in the best interest of both countries, then the UK is in danger of losing a special relationship. Well, the Indo-Pacific is emerging as a critical region in the world, uh, largely for geo-economic regions. Uh, the economic prosperity of East Asia and much of the rest of the world depends on what happens in this part of the planet. And the challenges uh, to the regional order that are present by both the rise of China and the retreat of the United States mean that other countries have to take uh, active measures to fill the role that previously was occupied by the US. Well, I think this is a very important time for the world to find out how well India is performing in terms of its economy. On paper, it looks fantastic, the fastest growing economy in the world, and there's been a huge amount of increased international investment in India. You've seen that in many sectors, in the railway industry, in healthcare, and so on. But clearly there are still a lot of challenges to doing business in India and that's something which is causing reservations, I think, to further investment. Indeed, it's a very timely moment to have this seminar and I think the Henry Jackson Society and the Democracy Forum have really come together to make for a, a really strong and enriching debate. Why is it important? Uh, for the simple reason that I think if uh, global Britain is to succeed, it must succeed with its good friend India. That's the headline. Uh, and what we had with Prime Minister Modi's visit only recently uh, to the United Kingdom was a strong affirmation of our relationship in a post-Brexit world, uh, centred around a technology partnership uh, above all, but it goes much wider than technology. It goes to uh, issues of uh, shared values, shared traditions and global partnership for the global good. So it's a, it's a really excellent time to be having the debate. Well, it's obviously very important and it's a very uh, fraught time with uh, Britain negotiating to get out of the European community 
Party. Uh, the temptation to see the partnership with India as part of a solution to the big changes that it's going to make to Britain's trading position is very great. I think they are very misconceived uh, and I think uh, a lot of people are deluding themselves about what is happening and what may happen, but we shall see. Bear with me, we're just filling up the first panel. Uh, my name is Dr. John Hemmings, I'm the director of the Asia Studies Centre here at the, um, not here, but at the Andrew Jackson Society. We're extremely uh, privileged and proud to be uh, hosting this uh, event today with the Democracy Forum. Um, as the keynote panel, kind of who will uh, give their opening remarks on the state of the relationship, uh, will now begin and we'll commence with the conference. So thank you very much. It feels strange welcoming all of you to somebody else's seminar, uh, but it's an honor and a privilege to do so. Uh, I wish I were Mark Field. You'll be looking at your programs and slightly confused. Um, Minister Field uh, has just come back from Bangladesh and apologizes for not being here today uh, to join us. So uh, who am I? I'm uh, Gareth Bailey. I'm the Foreign Office's Director for South Asia and Afghanistan. And so I have the privilege and pleasure to work uh, for most of my time on India. And uh, I think my role in this seminar is to say all the good positive stuff and others to knock that down, challenge it, tear it apart or certainly uh, provide alternative views and you wouldn't expect anything else from me. So uh, the seminar is Global Britain and India, a new special relationship and I think therefore I need to ask two, answer two questions. So what is this thing called Global Britain? And uh, I'll only take that to a certain point. Uh, there will be further deliberation, of course, around Brexit uh, through the course of this week, which will refine the answer. And uh, what then, if we know what Global Britain is, is the UK-India proposition in that? What is this special relationship? So what is Global Britain? Very rapidly. Uh, what we say, what we hold true to, is that it is a open, inclusive and outward-facing Britain playing a leading role in the world, having a new partnership with Europe, reinvesting in its relationships with elsewhere in the world, championing free trade and international justice, and standing by a set of values, those being human dignity, human rights, freedom, democracy, and equality, which is why it's such a pleasure to be here today with the Henry Jackson Society and the Democracy Forum. So that's Global Britain in some very short headlines. The UK-India proposition for that is that we uh, in the UK believe that there is a natural partnership to be had between Britain as one of the world's oldest democracies and India as its largest and most successful democracy. We have a shared set of values. It was Prime Minister Modi who uh, was good enough to give us the phrase a living bridge between our two countries, a phrase we have been mercilessly prosecuting ever since. It's a wonderful image of a intercommunity of people who are tied together personally, professionally, culturally, institutionally, and through language and legal traditions. And we have over one and a half million Indians, diaspora, here in the United Kingdom, making the country very great in all walks of life. And we have a shared global outlook. So the overall proposition is that uh, as Britain prepares to leave the European Union, it is non-discretionary to succeed in South Asia. If we cannot succeed in South Asia, with South Asia, then where could we succeed in the world? <laughs> so let me just say a word on what we do together and then what the plan might be for the future. What we do together is outstanding. Trade keeps rising. 2017 saw 18 billion pounds worth of trade, 15% up on the year before. Indian investment employs 100,000 Brits. The UK is the largest G20 investor in India and has been for the last 10 years straight. We invest nearly three times what Germany does, four times what France does, 
we account for nearly 30% of all EU investment into India. London, of course, the city plays its part, and you're all very familiar with masala bonds. Uh, so far, the London Stock Exchange has a combined value of 5 billion of masala bonds on its books, which is about 80% of the total. The city was extremely uh, happy uh, to take on what was an adventurous enterprise and, and run with it. But it's much wider than trade and investment. And what we would say, and how we characterize this, is that we're partners in a global force for good. Meaning what? Meaning a commitment to eradicate extreme poverty together by 2030, a commitment to a shift to a low carbon economy, to expanded access to sustainable energy. We were extremely uh, proud and pleased to have joined the International Solar Alliance, Prime Minister Modi's initiative. Uh, together, we're world leaders in research and innovation. And the list goes on and on in terms of the commitment that we have together to work in something wider than straightforward bilateral relations, a foreign office term, and trading and investing. And there's a harder edge to that. There's a sharper edge, which will no doubt be tested in the seminars ahead, and that is how the UK and India might work together in what is long been called a rules-based international order. Narrowing that down, we in the UK believe in a free and open Indo India Ocean region. And what we see, what is evident, is classic defense cooperation. But looking ahead, there's so much more to do around digital and cyber cooperation, protecting our economies and a free, open, peaceful, and secure cyberspace. So what does different look like? We were scratching our heads when uh, we were looking uh, at the plan for Prime Minister Modi's, Modi's visit to the UK just now around the Commonwealth Summit for the simple reason that there was so much going on and there was so much to celebrate that uh, we were genuinely being given the challenge in government and from the private sector is, well, what's new? What could be different? What could be more enriched than what you already have? And the proposition we came up with was technology. And we launched a new technology partnership. And it wasn't hard to identify that. Massive Indian tech sector, over 1.6 million digital tech jobs in the UK, a faster growing sector by far than non-digital, strong tech clusters across the UK and India, and Prime Minister May and Prime Minister Modi identifying shared grand challenges for the UK. The, the terminology is different, but actually the themes are very similar. The grand challenges for the UK were around artificial intelligence, clean growth, the future of mobility. For India, advanced manufacturing, make in India of course, renewables, electric vehicles. You can see a really strong overlap. Mm -hmm. So the plan ahead uh, that the two prime ministers agreed was to work on pairing and identifying businesses, VC, universities, delivery partners, providing access routes in both directions between Britain and India, and encouraging innovation and productivity which would lead to mentoring relationships in both directions, collaboration and exchanging of staff among firms. The concept has worked for the UK certainly before in Israel, where a tech hub generated something like deals of 62 million pounds, an impact of 0.6 billion for the UK economy. And if you take the scale of that, which is relatively small for obvious reasons, and you scale it to the size of the India-UK relationship, you begin to get into the many billions uh, of pounds figures. So that's all very positive. Let me tackle head on uh, what somebody may yet tackle here, which is the block. What are the blocks on cooperation? And what I often hear and come across in my job is uh, migration. That the challenge is that uh, Britain is not doing enough on migration and welcoming Indians to the United Kingdom. So let me just tackle that head on. Firstly, the number of visitors from India to the UK continues to rise year on year. Over half a million visit visas issued last year to Indian nationals. Secondly, we issue more skilled worker visas to India than to all other countries in the world combined, which is, to, to my uh, dim understanding of how this works, just an extraordinary fact. 
And then with the removal of the categories of doctors and nurses from the skilled worker uh, tier two category only recently, this frees up hundreds of additional places under tier two for other highly skilled workers such as engineers and IT professionals. So if you consider the number of T2 visas we already issue to Indians and you see the availability of visas ahead, you begin to see the scale of what could be done in terms of further uh, migration of skilled entrepreneurs, engineers and professionals to the UK. And finally, I will dwell on it, uh, but we continue to welcome Indian students. And those uh, numbers of visas, tier four as they're called, again increase year on year. So there is a definite charge put about migration, but then if you lift the lid on it and look into what is the state of play, it's a very, very strong uh, story to tell indeed. So in summary, Global Britain is open, outward, based around shared values with India, believing in international justice, trade and investment, and the relationship, we believe, uh, crosses this living bridge, which is stronger than ever, generates trade and investment figures that other Europeans can only aspire to, and is embedded in a wider relationship around promoting the global good. The next step will be a focus on technology, and I'll give the last word to Prime Minister Modi, who, when he was here, said, there will be no dilution in the importance of the UK to India post-Brexit. The City of London is of great importance to India for accessing global markets and will remain so. So I'll gladly take that from the His Excellency the Prime Minister and build on it. And thank you for your attention. I'm Charles Bruce speaking on behalf of the Democracy Forum and welcome you all here today. Um, there's no doubt that the pipeline of dip diplomatic activity between India and the UK has begun to flow much more freely in the last five years. And the Democracy Forum and its sister publication, Asian Affairs, have been following this process of, uh, engaging, uh, of increased engagement very closely. As you said, travelling to India in 2013 with a retinue of over 100 business leaders, David Cameron told his audience in Mumbai, we want to be partners for growth, partners for choice over the coming decades. Two years later, following Prime Minister Modi's visit to London, the British government unveiled a Defence and International Security Partnership, DISP, uh, to make security and defence a cornerstone of our relationship. And in April this year, as you've been telling us, the British and Indian governments met in London and unveiled a joint plan for responsible global leadership. Underpinning the initiative is the living bridge between the people of the two countries. According to the British government, it is this aspect that gives the greatest optimism. And as you said, Britain is home to 6% of India's global diaspora, an estimate, I think, of 1.8 million people. Yeah. Yes. Um, which is, of course, by far the largest diaspora in Europe. It's twice that of, 10 times that of Germany, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, 180,000. <laughs> Um, the 2018 India Meets Britain tracker has identified over 800 Indian-owned businesses based in the UK with a combined revenue of over £46 billion, providing employment for 10,500 people. I find that absolutely extraordinary. Uh, and as you said, Britain is India's third largest uh, direct foreign investor with a stock of $23 billion. Once it is free to negotiate a free trade agreement with India, Britain should be able to increase its trade by at least 50%, uh, which a, a recent Commonwealth report concluded. So evidently, the need to acknowledge the extent of Britain's living ties with India, together with growing trade and security collaboration, is a priority for the British government, as you've told us. And following the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London in April, greater emphasis was placed on India's increasing participation. But it's not clear, however, if India's trade and security priorities naturally are so closely aligned. The Financial Times reported in April that India dislikes signing meaningful trade details, uh, deals with anyone. And the article also pointed out the two biggest stumbling blocks, as you have uh, addressed already. <laughs> 
uh, slowing down a trade agreement currently in negotiation with the European Union, our Indian tariffs on Scotch whiskey, actually you didn't mention that, <laughs> that too. Uh, and visas to allow Indian professionals to work in Europe, of course mainly involved in the UK. But traditionally, India has had to balance three competing and often conflicting power relationships with Pakistan, China and the United States. It is an active participant in a number of regional treaty organizations, such as the Russia-India-China Trilateral, the Shanghai Pact, the Quadrilateral. India's involvement with each treaty betrays a finely pivotal calculation of great complexity. And I hope we will learn more about that uh, today from our very eminent panelists. We also need to bear in mind the existential basis of India's security policies, which has evolved over the last 70 years. In a celebrated minute, written in the year before India achieved independence, Jawaharlal Nehru composed his five principles of foreign policy. And he committed subsequent Indian governments to keep away from the power politics of groups aligned against one another which have led in the past to world war and which may again lead to, to disasters on an even vaster scale. So in reaching a closer alignment with India, I suggest that Britain needs to acknowledge the constraints imposed on India by its neighbors. And we also need to understand how India wants to be perceived as a global power. Now it has come into its prime. I think it's worth bearing in mind, perhaps, in 1955, following the Korean War, Winston Churchill congratulated Nehru as one old Harovian to another. He congratulated Nehru on his efforts to broker peace. He wrote, you might be able to do what no other human being could in giving India the lead, at least in the realm of thought, throughout Asia, and with the freedom and dignity of the individual as the ideal. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. And I'd like to firstly start by thanking uh, Charles and indeed uh, Ajit Singh Satbamba from the Democracy Forum for partnering with us on this. And, and to you, Gareth, for I think it shows the seriousness this subject has been taken that you're, you're joining us here today um, and giving us your thoughts on the nature of the relationship and how it can indeed be improved. So for us at the Henry Jackson Society, it has a pivotal, I think, uh, relationship going forwards. But I want to highlight just a couple of points that I think could, could come unstuck here. We've heard the the good bits, and I think it, it, it's very important to dwell on this. The trade and economic relationship is booming. Um, can it get better, though? That's a question. And I, I wish we were almost having this after Friday, after Friday's checkers meeting, because we might know a bit more about where the government actually stands on some of the key issues around the customs union and such like, which could prevent us from perhaps exploiting to the full. Um, the, the, uh, the economic relationship that we started to develop with India. So I, I think you know, what, one of the big questions really is what sort of Brexit will emerge. Of course we'll continue trading with India regardless of what happens. Of course there'll be opportunities. But there's no doubt that if we are in some senses tied to what we have been tied to for the past uh, years, that will create its own constraints as opposed to the possibilities, even taking into account India's dislike perhaps of trade deals, the possibilities that emerge over the horizon. So there's a, a question mark on that. I think on the constraints issue that Charles mentioned, it is true that India does have historical constraints in terms of its foreign and defence policy. But I think we've seen in Mr Modi a Prime Minister who's willing to shatter those wherever he can. Um, I think if you look at some of the bilateral relationships India's developed uh, with the USA, actually, I think what's surprised many people is the, uh, the way that US-Indian relations, regardless of presidents, have increased, and even under President Trump, have very much sort of transformed. India appears to be one of the countries that is benefiting from a Trump presidency. And um, I also, if you look at his relationship with, it, uh, with Israel, it's quite interesting to see the breaking of ground that would never have been done uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, how that's progressed forward. So it seems that we have someone as Indian Prime Minister who's willing to you know, look beyond the constraints of independence and see where the India of 2018 stands going into the 2020s, and that there may be a change as India acquires greater power, and with that, the greater responsibilities that that accrues as well. 
I think um, another potential stumbling block is the question of defence, and I'll tie this into two parts. On terrorism, it is quite clear that we in India have a lot to offer one another in terms of some of the challenges that we face, and obviously we do a lot of work in this area. And it, it's striking how, um, how, again, there are already, of course, ties developing in that area. There's much to be learnt from uh, best practice models, historic experience, how that works. But when it comes to the other application of hard power, which I hope we'll look at in the second panel, it does seem to me that Britain is going to need to be more present in the Indo-Pacific for us to be taken seriously as India. I, I won't mention who, but I had a very interesting discussion a couple of years ago with an Indian cabinet minister at the time, who I basically asked, I said, look, we share your concerns about certain developments in the, in the region, but do you take us seriously? And the answer was simply no, because you have no force that you're applying in the area. So if we in post-Brexit Britain wish to be taken seriously in a security sphere, we're going to have to accept that that involves being present and being part of the security architecture of that rules-based international system that Gareth mentioned uh, right at the start. So again, those are big questions for where Britain sees itself going forwards. But I don't want to dwell on the stumbling blocks. I think there are the opportunities. And I'm going to highlight you know, uh, the, the diaspora issue as well. That, I think, is key to some of the functionings going forward. So 1.8 million Indians here. And I'm particularly pleased to see Barry Gardner here, because although Barry and I have known each other from Brent politics, where we're on differing sides, I have to say, a politician like Barry, who has understood the importance of the Indian diaspora here in the UK and the contribution it can make to bilateral ties between the two nations speaks volumes for uh, vision and understanding of that important component of relations. And if we have more politicians who are willing to embrace that and look at the bilateral ties through the diaspora, how that can contribute to a, a heightened uh, set of relationships, I think that can only stand us in good stead compared to our competitors. And we must remember it's a competition essentially. In India is having its door knocked on by all types. The more people we can have doing the knocking for us, the more ties, the more connections can only be a good thing in that uh, respect and regard. So I think the diaspora is positive, I think the economics and trade are positive, the terrorism cooperation is positive. Um, it seems to me that we have opportunities in the diplomatic field as well, uh, post-Brexit, to tie into certain multilateral forums that we can both participate in. We clearly share uh, similar worries about uh, freedom of movement, uh, navally in the in the region as well. Those are all positives. I think we'll see those come out today. So what I'd commend us all to do is consider uh, in the round the relationship is in broadly a good place. Our challenge is to make that better. And I hope we'll uh, do a little bit to do that today. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like the next panel to please come up. Uh, and maybe some of our little helpers can uh, refresh the drinks and change the placards. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Gareth and Lord Bruce and Alan. Thank you very much for those introductory remarks. With that, let's, let's start the first panel uh, of Global Britain and India. Uh, time for a new special relationship. Um, as two of my guests, have, uh, one of them pointed out earlier, shouldn't that be a question mark? Uh, rather than a statement, is it time for a special relationship? Um, again, I'm Dr. John Hemmings, Director of the Asia Study Center. Um, just to kind of introduce you a little bit more to the concept of today, and I think in a way introducing it after two brilliant uh, introductory keynotes, we started off uh, thinking about the entirety of the relationship. The Democracy Forum and Henry Jackson Society are both fairly similar institutions in the sense that we look at foreign policy very much through values. Uh, the values that we, we think to be dear, whether they be uh, you know, rule of law or uh, plurality or freedom of the press or democracy, all those values tend to drive both our events and our thinking. And, and at a time where it seems to be a rise of authoritarian uh, powers, a decline in democracy, and even a decline in the support for democracies uh, inside the West, um, you know, these values, will they remain the glue that binds us? And to what extent do they bind us? Um, you know, coming from a Japan background as I do, one of the things that was always interesting for me to, was to see how India and Japan relate together on a different set of Asian values, which are just as coherent and strong 
in their eyes, but certainly quite different from the ones that uh, a Western audience might anticipate. Um, sitting uh, on my right is Dr. Champa Patel, who is the head of the Chatham House Asia Pacific Program. Uh, most welcome, a, a PhD from Nottingham, the former uh, regional and senior research advisor for uh, the South Asia, Southeast Asia and Pacific offices of Amnesty International and someone who I'm very pleased has joined us um, with a background on, on so strong on, on values. Uh, and then uh, on my uh, right hand side, Professor Sumatra Bose, um, also uh, an LSE, London School of Economics mafioso uh, friend um, from the uh, Professor of International and Comparative Politics, the author of no less than seven books, many of them on secularism and culture in uh, India, and also as a consultant for not only the US Department of State, the United Nations, <laughs> and the uh, Department for International Development and uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. Sir, you're most welcome. So um, with that, uh, Dr. Patel, sh should we kick off with you? And we'll have uh, maybe five, six minutes remarks, then uh, Professor Bose, and then we can open up to discussion with the audience. Dr. Patel. Thank you. Uh, I hope everyone can see me. I'm so short that I'm like literally just a head above this table. <laughs> but hopefully, if you can't see me, you can hear me. Um, so I'm here to talk about how does the UK perceive India? And it's interesting, it was an interesting question when John posed it, because obviously I'm a member of the diaspora as well. So I'm curious to think through more with you what that means about saying that the diaspora is an opportunity. But in terms of how does the UK perceive India? Well, I think it really depends, and I should add, I don't want to come across as a buzzkill now after the positive uh, you know, kind of expressions that we've heard. But I think that it is a special relationship, question mark. I don't think one can assume that it is a special relationship because I think there are particular issues at the moment that are putting this relationship under strain that one should take seriously, think about in the round in order to think through, okay, well, how do you strengthen the relationship than assume it's a strong relationship? So when we say the UK, well, who do we mean? Is it the UK of Theresa May and Liam Fox who say this is an important trading partner? We have a shared history, we have shared values. We want to capitalize literally on these historical historical links? Or is it the Theresa May who refused under ministerial pressure to lift the cap on tier two professional visas and under immense pressure then did a U-turn? Is it the Home Office that insisted on countering students within net migration <coughs> figures? So I don't think we can discount this because the reality is since these immigration reforms have come into place, what we have seen is a dramatic reduction in the number of Indian students who are willing to come to the UK to study. And even though there's been a slight increase recently in net figures, it's only a few thousand people. And I think it matters. There was a British Council report that said to Indians, what is the appeal of the UK as a destination country? And number one was education. So certainly you can look at those figures and think there's a sense that the UK is not welcoming of uh, Indian students. Or is it the Home Office which straight after this decision made changes to the visa rules that saw China on the list of countries that don't have to undergo a tough visa process but not India? Now these may seem like minor things that we you know, may want to quibble over the details of this, but I think it, what it points to is the perception gap that the UK government doesn't necessarily speak with one voice to Indians. So I think there's a dissonance between trade rhetoric the aspirations around international trade mm. and domestic immigration policies and approaches. And I think it, this is creating a perception and reality gap that if we are not careful, it will become very difficult to bridge. And I think it's something that is causing strain in the relationship. If we, well, in my experience of speaking to Indian diplomats, there's certainly a sense of mobility is key to any kind of trade deal, not just for students, but also for professionals. So I think this is something that we need to bridge. And I think what we see at the moment uh, is an attempt to play to different galleries. So in international trade, it's about, you know, Brexit is a pathway to global Britain. But if you look at the immigration rhetoric, then it seems like global Britain is in dynamic tension with Brexit. So I think these are some of the things that still need unpicking in order to really optimize the potential of the relationship. Um, and I think what it reflects or is indicative of is the lack of a joined up strategy towards India. There's a bigger question here of what kind of relationship do these two countries want to have 
with each other, recognizing the world that we live in now. So I think geopolitics is changing. India is an emerging power. If you look at its demographic dividend, how its, you know, its economy has increased, this is a very important country. But one could also argue, and there are analysts that argue that post-Brexit, will the UK be a decline in power? So there are certain asymmetries to think about here. And I think a sense of humility is needed in thinking through how can these two countries craft an agenda that is in their mutual interests, recognize the constraints on both sides, and kind of find a common path forward together. But I don't think one can gloss over the difficulties that we're facing at the moment in the relationship, which certainly on the Indian side, what I hear is immense consternation and frustration of some of what's happening. And as I understand it, some of the kind of stumbling blocks around the issue of you know, Indians overstaying on the visas that they're here. But I think this is, again, reflective of a lack of a strategic vision. Because none of these things are insurmountable. If there's an issue with overstayers, it's in the Indian interest to also deal with these things. But somehow the approach taken is to take this little issue and put everything else at risk because of it. So I think there needs to be a greater flexibility. So for example, in the proposed MOU, it was said that um, for Indians that need to deport him back, it would take 15 days to identify, verify, and deport. But if anybody is familiar with the vagaries of Indian bureaucracy, it's highly unlikely that anything is is going to happen in 15 days. <laughs> I think also what there is is a knowledge gap about modern India. You know, we, we like to luxuriate in the days of the Raj, but how much does modern UK know about modern India? And again, the same British Council report found that double the numbers of Indians, so Indians had a greater awareness of what the UK had to offer than similar demographics in the UK of India. It was almost half as many UK people knew about India. So I think we have to move past the days of, you know, the Raj, our soft power, our cultural products reflect this kind of past that just doesn't exist anymore. So I think there's something about uh, dealing with the knowledge gap that exists now. And just some final thoughts. I think there is a lack of joined up thinking in Westminster and Whitehall about what sort of re relationship these two countries should have. <coughs> I think to have a meaningful relationship requires a level of skill and diplomacy that is lacking at the moment. Um, and I don't think changing visas is the whole story. I think there's a bigger need here to think about the mutual strengths of each party, what they bring to the table, and really craft a relationship of equals moving forward. And at the moment, you know, there are these perceptions on either side where it feels like the UK is assuming a lot, there's some arrogance there, the Indians have their frustrations, their consternation of what they think are the kind of, you know, flip-flopping or kind of contradictory rhetoric that they hear from the UK side. So I think some humility is needed to come to the table and have a new conversation. We may have had a shared past together, but you know, I'm an example of somebody that, well, I'm here because they were there, right? I'm not sure that uh, empire is something you want to build a future relationship on. So I think there's a need to rethink some of the language that's used, the dynamics that are talked about, in order to really think about how these two countries could work together. My worry is if we don't, then the UK could be sleepwalking into irrelevance in terms of this uh, relationship. So I hate to end on that downbeat note, but I'm hoping Professor will be more It didn't sound downbeat, me. it sounded rousing. <laughs> and maybe we need rousing, maybe we need rousing. Professor Bose, please. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you, John. Um, I'm really happy to be here for a very timely discussion and let the sun keep shining forever <laughs> on the Britain-India relationship. Um, uh, I do admire uh, Champa's spirit of candor and what she calls downbeat, somebody else might characterize as simply realistic. Um, uh, and I think we all are realists here, or aspire to be. Um, of course, um, the, the past, the, the historical past from you know, roughly 1757 uh, until 1947, nearly two centuries, um, of the Britain-India relationship is not a particularly happy one. Uh, most uh, Indian points of view would agree on that uh, to uh, varying degrees. 
and uh, the, the number and influence of Raj nostalgics uh, has been steadily dwindling uh, down the decades of independent India, and India now is very much, with all its uncertainties, uh, in the 21st century. Um, that said, um, contemporary 21st century relationships between significant states and India and the United Kingdom are both uh, significant states, uh, cannot be defined by uh, historical baggage. Um, much is also being made, and you know, understandably, you know, rightly so, of uh, the uncertainty over Britain's role you know, uh, in Europe, beyond Europe, globally, uh, in the Brexit scenario, what will happen in the wake of Brexit? I did catch the last minutes of the uh, of the opening um, discussion. Um, however, you know, the world as a whole is very uncertain. You know, right now, uh, <clears throat> think of what's uh, going on in the United States. Uh, you know, the tariff wars, um, the 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 spats over uh, migration, um, and so on. And India too, as anyone who knows anything about India would uh, uh, would realize, is full of uncertainties for various reasons. So uncertainty is not something that is unique to Britain at the current conjuncture of history. It's something that's widespread across the world at the current conjuncture of history and applies very much to India as well. Um, of course, the institutional legacies of uh, British colonial rule are very apparent in India. Um, we have uh, uh, pretty much uh, the same uh, quote-unquote Westminster style uh, model of parliamentary democracy, cabinet government, uh, prime minister being the top dog, accountable to uh, parliament, um, no pun intended. Um, the, um, and of course, with one big divergence from the classic you know, Westminster model, uh, the decentralized structure of the Indian Union um, since its inception in the 1950s. But that said, uh, that structure is not very different from the structure of post-devolution uh, UK, uh, the structure the UK has had for the last uh, 20 years. So there are you know, historical influences, there are parallels in our political systems, and indeed in our uh, contemporary post-colonial uh, political values. That's a lot to go on. Um, that said, let me try and pick up uh, you know, where Trumper was heading and highlight a few key and perhaps unnecessary irritants of the Britain-India relationship in an everyday sense. Uh, irritants that affect a lot of people, uh, common citizens, as well as uh, inter-elite relationships you know, between the leaders, and that uh, regularly make uh, headlines in India. And for someone who's been uh, based for work reasons in, in London for the last uh, two decades, um, it's particularly unfortunate for me to see uh, Britain making headlines in the Indian uh, press uh, and the Indian media um, for the wrong reasons. Um, there are three <coughs> you know, everyday irritants um, that I'll flag up. Um, you know, first of all, um, between 2012 and 2018, uh, the number of uh, student visas for higher education uh, granted to Indian students, and therefore of the number of Indian students who come to the UK uh, to go to uh, university at either the undergraduate or the postgraduate level, has more than halved. Uh, from um, over 30,000 uh, six years ago to just around 15,000 or so um, today. In the meantime, over the same period, um, by way of comparison, um, Canada, uh, the number of Indian students going to Canadian universities, and Canada also has, um, like the UK, uh, a considerable number of uh, world-class uh, universities, um, has zoomed. It's kind of gone through the roof to the extent that as of this year, uh, the number of Indian students going to Canada for higher studies is six times the number coming to the United Kingdom. Um, a second kind of uh, irritant um, uh, is 
that uh, a two-year multiple entry visa uh, for an Indian tourist or an Indian business visitor uh, costs approximately five times um, his or her Chinese counterpart, you know, PRC, People's Republic of China counterpart, would pay for it. Uh, it's uh, about 80 or 85 pounds for uh, the Chinese, and the exact same two-year multiple entry UK visa costs something like 400 pounds for an Indian citizen. Anyone wanting to come here for either tourism uh, or, for, uh, uh, or for business purposes. Um, uh, there has also been some unfortunate you know, publicity in very recent uh, weeks uh, over the fact that uh, about a dozen countries, maybe 11 or so, uh, have had um, their uh, requirements for gaining students' visas uh, you know, relaxed. Uh, it's easier for those countries now, including the People's Republic of China, uh, but India was conspicuously uh, exempted uh, from that list with no uh, apparent reason, at least none being given. Um, the final irritant uh, may be more comical than anything else, but it does cause uh, some you know, diplomatic uh, embarrassment, uh, and that is uh, the presence of uh, Indian uh, fugitives uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, particularly in London, and by sheer coincidence, you know, their hideouts tend to be in the very area of London where we are sitting uh, at the moment. That seems to be their preferred uh, bolt holes. Um, well, we have a former uh, kind of uh, a cricket baron, if that's the correct uh, word, uh, the founder of the spectacularly successful and popular uh, Indian uh, Premier League, which takes place every April. April, May. Um, we have um, a perhaps more serious case of a rather flashy tycoon uh, whose uh, now defunct airline I admit to flying um, on uh, many occasions when it was in existence. Um, I even had a frequent flyer uh, card for that airline, I confess, which is now uh, the uh, kind of the you know complete you know junk you know the most useless piece of plastic lying in a drawer somewhere. Um, the same uh, gentleman is also um, uh, was also the man behind the Kingfisher calendar, uh, which, as many of us will know, is the Indian equivalent of the uh, 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 the swimsuit uh, uh, issue of Sports Illustrated uh, in the United States and internationally. Um, and then, of course, uh, the latest addition to that uh, hallowed list is a jeweler to the rich and famous. Um, now, um, you know, uh, there are legitimate concerns of due process and the rights of people, and perhaps Champa being a rights person will appreciate that. I appreciate that too. Um, however, um, the impression does go across, whether inadvertently or not, I think inadvertently, um, there is great scope for improvement here, for better management, for more sensible and reasonable policies, that while Indian students Indian tourists, even Indian business visitors, are perhaps not particularly welcome. Uh, at least they are not being you know, embraced with open arms by the United Kingdom. Uh, Indian you know, fugitives uh, seem to have a safe haven uh, in, uh, in Mayfair, uh, uh, at least. Um, so those are the three um, irritants. Um, let me just go to the second part of uh, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, um, well, you know, India's relative importance in the world, and it's growing. You know, India is on the upward trajectory. Uh, it may be um, stumbling and kind of somewhat awkward, uh, uneven upward trajectory, but very few will doubt. Um, even India's detractors uh, would not doubt that India is on the upward trajectory in the world, that its uh, uh, role, its significance in world affairs is growing. Uh, perhaps gradually, but it is growing. So rising India is not hyperbole. Um, what can, so any country in the world, um, you know, has kind of an interest in, in cultivating India in, in one way or the other. Um, as for 
the Indian presence in Britain, uh, I could give the example, as we all know, of uh, just one Indian company, the Tatas, albeit uh, a major you know, Indian company, uh, with a lot of uh, prestige and history uh, attached to its brand. You know, there's uh, you know, Jaguar Land Rover, of course. Uh, there's Tata Steel here, the plant in Port Talbot, uh, the link up with uh, Thyssen Group. Uh, and Tata Consultancy Services, which employs many young people in, in London, uh, and, and so on. Now, what could be um, the points of convergence for a stronger and um, more robust you know, Britain-India relationship uh, at this current conjuncture? Um, I think this is something that uh, leaders in Britain, and I don't mean only those in government, because governments come and go, you know, governments change. Um, I don't only mean, you know, politicians, but opinion formers from, you know, all sectors of uh, society um, should think, you know, very long and hard about, you know, what could be the points of convergence, kind of the sweet spots that could promote uh, a more robust and substantive Britain-India relationship today. Uh, and I'd like to give the example of the Japan-India relationship. Um, I'm no expert in Japan, uh, but um, we all know that the Japan-India relationship is one of the most you know, robust and healthy uh, bilateral relationships that India has in the 21st century. Um, it's one of the big you know, payoffs of the Look East policy that uh, Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao initiated uh, some 25 years ago at, at, uh, uh, at that point. Um, and of course, you know, Look East was kind of rebranded as Act East uh, by the Modi government a few years ago. Um, well, um, what brings Japan and India together in this very harmonious and robust relationship. Um, although both Asian countries, the cultures are in fact quite different, so it's not you know, some sort of a, you know, cultural convergence, um, you know, so to speak. Um, but there are other points of convergence. There are real sweet spots there. Uh, number one, um, I'll, I'll check off three. Number one, uh, Japan has for a long time, not just for India, but for many you know, developing countries, um, been a, a major donor of uh, development aid. And that role has somewhat changed in recent decades as India has slowly you know, pulled itself out, uh, largely not entirely by any means of the trap of mass poverty. Um, but Japan, for example, is a very important donor to uh, uh, Indian infrastructural projects uh, in numerous Indian states. Uh, there's something called the JICA, I think, the Japan uh, in International Cooperation uh, Agency. Um, and it's, um, and uh, JICA is active in you know, states across the country, you know, supporting particularly you know, infrastructure development rather than kind of poverty uh, alleviation as was the case a few decades ago. Um, second, um, the presence of Japanese business um, the you know the the world leading you know very well known you know Japanese brands uh, in various sectors of uh, manufacturing um, uh, and production, um, but also you know somewhat lesser known companies as well. Um, many of them, um, hundreds of them in fact, uh, are present in India. You know Prime Minister Modi's uh, home state Gujarat um, has the presence of literally dozens and scores of Japanese uh, companies, uh, you know, big name companies, the world leading brands, as well as uh, their lesser known counterparts. So there's uh, Japan as a development donor, um, Japan as a supporter of uh, a growing emerging India's infrastructural needs, and Japanese you know, private business as an important player in uh, numerous uh, Indian states. And the final point that I think really supports the three 